highlight, highlighting the stories of each chapter. And today is on the subject of Daniel and exile. The last 17 weeks, we've made many discoveries, just like that little boy. We've talked about creation, the Garden of Eden, God's covenant with Abraham and the nation of Israel, the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the giving of the commandments and the establishment of the law, the kingdoms of Saul, David, and Solomon, and the division and fall of the once proud nation of Israel. Over the last several weeks, we have grown weary of the same song, different verse of a people whose leaders the Bible describes as stiff-necked 18 times in the Old Testament, and a people and leaders as those who did evil in the sight of God 43 times in the Old Testament. But God has finally had enough. And last week we heard these words from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 36. We heard the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people. And then we heard these devastating words. And there was no remedy. If you've ever been in a situation where due to health, family circumstances, occupation, whatever it might be, when you've heard those words, there is no remedy. What news could you get? That would be worse than that. And that's the description that God placed upon his people. As part of God's judgment, the remnant of the southern kingdom was taken captive into Babylon. And it would seem that all was lost. But wait! There's more. You see, there's a stream running through every page of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we call it the scarlet thread of redemption. Do you remember when we started this series, the first lesson? is that God killed animals after the fall of Adam and Eve. He killed Adam, he killed animals after they realized that sin showed them that they were now naked before God, and God killed animals to make a covering for Adam and Eve. And the first time we saw the shedding of blood for the needs of mankind. And that theme exists throughout the Old and into the New Testament in every book of the Bible. And that scarlet thread of redemption that operated in Daniel's day and still operates today is the scarlet thread, the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all sin. The covenants, the promises, God made so many years ago are still our hope today. And this leads me into chapter 18 of the story. It's called Daniel in Exile. But I'd like to change the name of that chapter. I'd like to call it the Babylonian boondoggle <laughs> or the Hebrew children who wouldn't bow, budge, or burn. Let's begin by meeting our heroes. In the story, page 249, in Daniel chapter 1. You remember the story from last week. Jerusalem is destroyed, and the people are taken captive into Babylon. And we read these words. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. By the way, as I read this and describe these Israelites, as you realize that how they are described describes you, please feel free to stand, okay? <laughs> Young men, without any physical defect, 
and some. Showing aptitude for every kind of learning. Well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. It's interesting. I'm glad that that practice stopped in my generation because my father's father named him after his grandfather and going on back, they alternated every generation. And had that not stopped, you would be calling me Cornelius. <laughs> so I'm glad that that provision changed. <laughs> Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the chief official gave them new names, to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Mishak, and to Azariah, Abednego. Reminds me of the story of the young seminarian who was given the assignment to preach in chapel from memory on the subject that we're considering today. And he had such trouble with these names that he had to write them out on a piece of paper and he had to pin them to the inside of his coat. So if he couldn't remember, he could go there and read the names. And sure enough, as he was preaching, he said the three Hebrew children, Joseph A. Bank. <laughs> now, if you're as old as I am, if I had said Hart, Schaffner, and Marx, you would have understood. But they're out of business. Let's meet. Their new king, Nebuchadnezzar the Great. He reigned as king of Babylon. He was the greatest monarch the Babylonians had ever produced. He was a brilliant military leader. He plundered articles from God's temple in Jerusalem, and he placed them in his pagan temples in Babylon. And like so many leaders, he was a prideful, prideful man. And we understand that our heroes were strangers in a strange land. And here is our first application. You see, we too are strangers in a strange land. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he tells us that Christians are strangers in the world. We sing the chorus, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. In the lower story, I'm a citizen of the United States. In the upper story, I'm a citizen of heaven. And now that we've identified ourselves with our four heroes, we want to let the adventures they endured serve as example, examples of how to live our lives in a foreign world. Our first example I'd like to call, What's for Dinner? God's Menu or Babylon. Remember, those captives were conscripted to serve Nebuchadnezzar, and they were to eat his food. Page 250 of the story tells us that our heroes resolved not to defile themselves with the royal food and wine of Babylon and asked the chief official for permission not to defile themselves by perhaps eating what for a Jew would not be kosher. They did not compromise by making excuses. They could have concluded that it was useless to resist, we are so few, they are so many, we are not home anymore, this is no longer Kansas, Toto, things have changed. <laughs> they could have concluded that they were now in Babylon, and when in Babylon, we do what the Babylonians do. But no, they did not make demands, but they asked 
ask humbly your permission to eat nothing but vegetables and drink water. They did not make demands, but humbly asked for permission to live according to God's command. Now they understood that if that permission had not been granted, there would be consequences. But it's important to take note of their attitude and their demeanor. I find often that Christians demand that society act in a certain way. And I wonder, is it any wonder that society often rejects our message? We should point out that this is not a proof text, as some would make it to be, that we should all be vegetarians. Generations earlier, the Israelites were given a set of dietary laws at Mount Sinai. These are recorded in, by Moses and are found in Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 14. God told Moses that certain animals were clean to eat. Those with woven hoofs, which chewed the cud, such as cattle, goats, sheep, deer, and so forth, all fish with fins and scales, and insects of the locust family were also clean. The pig and the camel, however, were unclean and were not to be eaten. All carnivorous birds, sea creatures without fins and scales, most insects, rodents, reptiles, and so forth were unclean. And this is the essence of the dietary laws which came from God and which these young men brought with them from Jerusalem into Babylon. Because of these dietary laws, they asked permission, please, let us eat only vegetables. The purpose of these dietary laws was actually for the well-being of the people. In Exodus chapter 15, God said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. You see, there is a practical reason for God's commands. They have a legitimate value. And it had a legitimate value for our heroes. Daniel and his friends knew that the Babylonians would not observe these dietary laws. How could they always know which foods given to them by their captors would be acceptable to God? and which would not. There was a student from China back in my day at Pacific College whose name was Chick Kim Kong. He loved to take me to a hole-in-the-wall restaurant in Chinatown. He would order our food in Chinese, and I never really knew what I was eating. <laughs> but I knew it was good. When I asked him what it was, he would just get a smile on his face, and he would not answer me. <laughs> the, food in Babylon, the food the Babylonians ate was probably incredible. It wasn't kosher. The way to be sure was to be obedient. Obedient to God's command. And that meant eating vegetables. Last night I officiated a wedding. The bride is from India. And they did things a little differently. They started off with hors d'oeuvres before the ceremony. And then they had dinner afterward. And the food was Indian food. And I don't know what I ate, but I know it was good. And I can appreciate the dilemma that our young heroes had in their day. It probably tasted wonderful. How would they know that the food of Babel was acceptable to God? So they asked graciously and kindly, Please, we desire to be obedient to the command God has given us. And the way we can be saved is to eat only vegetables. Today, the old Levitical laws do not bind us, but we are bound by the law of love. And the New Testament is clear that just as Daniel and his friends had a duty to God, we have today a duty of love not to defile ourselves in speech or action 
or attitude in such a way to hinder our testimony. We are to live in the upper story. The second example that we learn from these children of Jerusalem that have been forced into conscription into Babylon is that living in obedience to God has its reward and has its blessing. Maybe some of the rich food the king tried to pawn off on Daniel and his friends disagreed with the king's sleep because he was prone, the Bible says, to a troubled mind and crazy dreams which he could not remember. Anyone relate? You ever had something crazy for dinner and, wow, what a night we had. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar knew what it was all about. Now they were all in big trouble because he said Nebuchadnezzar called all of his magicians, his enchanters, his sorcerers, and his astrologers to tell them what he had dreamed. He knew he had dreamed, but he couldn't remember it. And he knew it bothered him, and he knew he was troubled. And so he called all of the wise men of his kingdom. He said, tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me the interpretation of the dream. But none of them could do so. And they said, King, first tell us your dream, and then we will tell you what it means. It's kind of like walking into a convenience store and letting the people know, I won the lottery. Oh, yeah? Where's your ticket? Show us the winning number. Well, give, us, give me the winning number, and then I'll confirm if that's the one on my ticket. The same situation. All of these wise men were in deep trouble because of the consequences of them not, number one, being able to tell the king what he dreamed, and then, number two, being able to tell the king what the dream meant. And the Bible tells us that he was so angry that they couldn't tell him his dream, that the king ordered all of the wise men, including Daniel and his friends, to be put to death. Daniel, after finding out that they were about to be put to death, asked the reason why. Page 251 of the story, Daniel chapter 2. We read, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Daniel. Now think about that for a minute. If he got rid of all that was good and wise, what would he be left with? And that was his order. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, listen to this. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and power. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch had explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and demanded order. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God. Once again, we learn from Daniel through the example of obedience. We also observe that he spoke, not like I perhaps would have spoken, but he spoke in the face of execution. He spoke with wisdom, and he was tactful. He did not demand. He asked. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with reverence and respect. You know the result. Daniel, through his obedience to God, was given not only that what the king had dreamed, but also the interpretation of the dream. And the results we find on page 253 of the story. Again in Daniel chapter 2, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king
king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained in the royal court. In the war story, we demand that we get emotional. In the upper story, we observe conduct that is wise and gentle. Another example is that Daniel's friends chose to say to, no to the king and yes to God. We have to ask, what in the world is wrong with Nebuchadnezzar? As a result of the revelation of his dream and the interpretation of the dream, he gives praise to the God of Daniel. He gives praise to the God of Israel, and then he turns right around and he is, builds an idol to himself. Amazing. He builds a huge monstrosity of an idol and he orders everyone to fall down and worship. Well, you know the story. Daniel's buddy, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow to the king's idol. The king's wise men came and tattled jealousy. This isn't an awful thing. It causes people to be terrible things. They couldn't be elevated in any other way <coughs> the wise men of the kingdom, except to tattle and to tell like little children. You know what, king? You built this idol. We know that it represents you. But these guys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they didn't fall down and worship the king. They went and they passed. You know the story. They failed to worship the king. It reminds them of the penalty for their actions. And that king Nebuchadnezzar begins to eat up the barbecue. Then he asks, what has to be one of the world's dumbest questions? Remember the activity of these young men, their honesty, their forthrightfulness, their willing to even die rather than to not be obedient to their God, their attitude and demeanor to ask rather than demand. And this is the dumb question that he asked just before he throws them into the furnace. What God? will be able to rescue you from my hand. This is another answer, page 255 of the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set. We believe our God is able to rescue us, and even if he does not, we will not bow, we will not touch, and we'll find out they also will not. This was a great answer, but it didn't impress Nebuchadnezzar. Here's his reaction. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace even seven times hotter than usual, and commanded some of the stronger soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the blazing furnace. 
So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to, leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the furnace? They replied, certainly no. said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, giving each other high fives and chest bumps, <laughs> and unarmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Many theologians believe that this was the pre incarnate Christ. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was the hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, their house turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this world. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let me ask this a question this morning. Are there any furnaces that anyone is facing today? Possible consequences for being obedient to God? Maybe at work, school, maybe in business? Remember, God is sufficient, whether the outcome is the one you would want or another one. God is sufficient. Remember what we just read. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up their wives rather than serve and worship any god except their own God. Obedience even in the face of persecution, pleases God. In the New Testament book of Acts, Peter and his apostles found themselves in a similar situation. They had to choose to obey the Jewish leaders and stop preaching the gospel or obey God. Of course, they chose to obey God. The result was not a fiery furnace, but prison and flogging. And the scripture tells us they rejoiced because they had been counted worthy of being disgraced before men for being obedient to God. A fourth example, Daniel meets a new king, small k, but does not forget the real king, capital K. With a new king come new opportunities and challenges. And we discover in our reading of the story that after the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, a new king, King Darius, came to power. Daniel is now under the attack of the king's administrators. They wanted to get him, but they couldn't find a way to do so. And they finally realized there's only one way to get him. We want what he has, and we don't have it. And so we are willing to do whatever it takes to put ourselves in the same position that Daniel was in. So they cannot. And they put together a plan. Politics is the same today as it was then. And they set out to get Dan. And they agreed the only way to do it was to use Daniel's favor against them. They applaud, they appeal. 
appeal to the pride of King Darius. We find it on page 258 of the story, Daniel chapter 6. So the administrators and satraps went up as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. For they were brethren him The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. See what they were doing? They were using the law for their own selfish purposes. So King Darius put the decree in writing. There can only be one explanation for what he did. And again, that's right. Now when Daniel learned of the decree that had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. This edict, this decree, did not change Daniel one bit. And I see an interesting parallel between the politics of Daniel's day and the politics of today. The law was made, and the king's administrators then used the law for their own selfish purposes. <laughs> today, special interest groups do the same thing. For example, the 14th Amendment of our Constitution, which guarantees equal rights under the law. Because modern society's world view has changed so much, even in just a few generations. What is demanded today in the name of equal rights would not have even been thought of a generation or two ago. Well, you know the rest of the story. Because of Daniel's obedience and faithfulness to God, instead of providing the cats a tasty dinner, the cats provided Daniel with a warm fur coat. We read about it on page 259 of the story. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. The stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own sacred ring and with the rings of his nobles. And so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment, being brought to him <coughs> not sweet. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, as your God whom you serve continually, able to rescue you from the lions. Daniel answered, O king, my God has sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have, nor have I ever done any wrong before you. Listen to what the king did. Daniel chapter 6, then King Darius wrote to all of the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel. Darius has become a theologian. <laughs> the conclusion of the matter is this. Living in obedience to God brings miraculous blessings. Whether the outcome is good or whether the outcome is bad, according to the Lord's story. It's always good, according to the other story. What counts is obedience. Obedience to God. The 
pays to say no to convenience and yes to God. Convenience can become our God. Living a life of convenience makes it easier. But living a life of inconvenience may be what God requires of us from time to time. Putting God first in our lives results in His blessing. Oh, the outcome, again, may not be what we would desire. There may be circumstances and situations that we would rather not face. But obedience to God always results in His blessing. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be one of our heroes? Can you imagine what it would be like, the emotions that you would have as you are bound and thrown into the fire? And you're fine. And you're fine. Can you imagine what they went through? Can you imagine what furnaces we may be subjected to? And to go face those with the attitude that God is sufficient and I will be obedient regardless of the outcome. We will be fine. Finally, we must put God, our heavenly King, first. Who knows what opportunities there may be from lax, to give up our principles, to make excuses, to take the easy way out. But remember our heroes. Remember that we must put God, our heavenly King, first. Our final thoughts that look like the end of the Jews is really a new start. A new beginning. So I encourage you to come back next week. <laughs> Chapter 19's title is The Return Home. God is not finished with them yet. And he is not finished with us yet. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, these stories seem so outrageous compared to our lives. And yet we know that the truth of them is just as applicable to us. You desire that we be obedient to you, even if it means being disobedient to others, to other sisters. You desire that we be, first of all, obedient to you. You desire that we commit ourselves to your plan and your purpose for our lives. Father, we acknowledge the outcome may not always be what we want, but we know that you are sufficient. Lord, thank you for the excitement of looking back on the lives of these four young men. And then the excitement of allowing you to work in our lives today. Give us your grace and strength to do and to be what you would have us to do. We look forward next week to a new beginning, going home. A new start. Thank you that it will remind us that that is always also true in our own lives. That God has given us that opportunity for a new beginning, a new start. Dismiss us with your blessing, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed to the side